In my view, Star Trek Deep Space Nine is comfortably one of the greatest sci-fi shows of all time and painfully underrated. Strangely enough, both Enterprise and DS9 developed their own niche fan bases within the franchise, which I suppose separated them from the next generation Voyager and the original series to a certain degree. But of course, Deep Space Nine was a much more critically celebrated and remembered series than Enterprise. Despite this, DS9 was frequently overshadowed by its more iconic predecessor, TNG. This is actually a shame in my view, because DS9, I think, is a far superior series. It's just perhaps a little less accessible given the complexity and depth of its mythology and its use of serialized story arcs. TNG was mostly standalone. By comparison, TNG, while fantastic and groundbreaking for the time, is a much simpler two-dimensional series. DS9 has an awful lot more going on, more character development, more conflict, numerous multifaceted series-long plot threads, and a darker and more believable tone. I'm not going to explain every little thing about the show in this video. I'm going to write this for the Deep Space Nine fans, for people who are already familiar with the show. Otherwise, this would be a very long summary video. So if you haven't seen the show before, you're probably not going to understand the references to characters and events I'll be talking about. I think Avery Brooks took a little time to find his feet with Cisco in the beginning, but he grew into the ideal frontman for this show. I always felt that Picard was more the diplomat on TNG and Cisco was the warrior on DS9. The series is obviously a major departure from the other series in that it takes place primarily on a space station rather than a starship. The idea was that Deep Space Nine was a center of commerce, trade, and recreation, and that rather than our heroes traveling out into the stars each week in a ship, that the universe would instead visit them. Of course, in the first few seasons, there were space exploration episodes that took place away from the station, thanks to the use of runabout shuttlecraft. It wasn't until season three that the introduction of the USS Defiant would allow for more of these kinds of stories. With the escalation of the Dominion conflict, Starfleet developed a warship, originally designed to take on the Borg, now employed in the defense of the station, and even equipped with a Romulan cloaking device, so it was very unique. Everything about DS9 just felt more hardcore than TNG, but it took time to develop. In the first season, stories were, I think, paced quite slowly, and the writers and producers were still trying to establish the show's direction, though many of the long-standing plot threads, they were there from the very beginning. Odo's quest to know more about his people is established right from the very beginning in the fantastic pilot Emissary. Also, Sisko's relationship with Bejor and the Prophets, his role as their spiritual leader, the Emissary, is there right from the start. I will admit, in the first season, DS9 feels less like a second Star Trek spin-off and more like a spin-off of TNG. This is evidenced by the fact that the writers threw in as many crossovers from TNG in the first few episodes as possible in order to help promote the show. Like Q and Vash's presence, for example, just felt forced. And though it was funny to see Cisco punch Q in the face, Q had more chemistry with Picard and Janeway than he did with Cisco. I tired of many of the heavy Bajoran political stories in seasons one and two, but this story arc did have one very special component to it. The relationship between Cardassian Goldicott and the Bajoran people. Mark Alemo brilliantly plays this incredibly complex character who straddles the line between frequent recurring villain and reluctant borderline ally on occasion but it's his narcissism and self-delusion that makes him so compelling. Ducat genuinely believes he was a liberator and a hero to the Bajoran people during the occupation, despite the unspeakable things he did to them. He thinks of himself as a great leader and not a complete tyrant, which is exactly what he was, and that's why I like this character. He's not some wooden and cliched mustache-twirling villain. He genuinely believes he's the good guy in his own story. He cannot see his own flaws, and nor can he understand the immense revulsion that someone like Kira has for him. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but this all comes to the fore in Season 6, when after a fantastic six-episode story arc, the Federation retakes Deep Space Nine from the Cardassians and the Dominion during Sacrifice of Angels. Fantastic episode. Dukat's daughter, Zial, refuses to leave the station with him and wishes to remain with the Resistance. Damar kills her, and Dukat's emotional breakdown, his grief, 
grief and also his disbelief at losing the station are quite moving and tragic. I, I just remember that line. He says, victory was within our grasp. It's such a great tragic moment. It's a sign of a very good show that you can feel such sympathy for the villain in this way. And Ducat was also sufficiently deluded that he believed his adversarial relationship with Cisco was actually a friendship, which was explored in the brilliant episode Waltz, in which both men are stranded together on a planet. By the third season, the show had finally found its feet, and like most Trek shows, it tends to take a couple of years for things to really begin to gel. Over the next four seasons, it became increasingly anchored by numerous interpersonal relationships, like the friendship between O'Brien and Bashir, the developing romantic relationships of Worf and Dax, Kira and Odo, Sisko and Cassidy Yates. The show was also aided by a significant recurring cast that often were as pivotal to the stories and just as well-developed as the regular cast. These included villains and allies, the female shapeshifter, Weyoun, Damar, Rom, Lita, General Martok, the always enigmatic and complex Garrick, Nog, and many more. What I especially appreciated was the level of depth the show added to the pre-existing Star Trek mythology. Every alien species in the franchise was developed with their own culture and identity expanded upon significantly. The presence of Quark as a regular allowed the writers to flesh out the Ferengi beyond just the one-dimensional clown-like buffoons they were on TNG. I especially love the show's exploration of moral ambiguity and the grey areas between good and evil. Quark was a classic example of this. He was a dodgy character, motivated by his desire for profit, but ultimately, he found a reason to do the right thing in a pinch, albeit reluctantly at times. He has a wonderful quote in the episode The Siege of AR-558 that showed how introspective he could be. Let me tell you something about humans, nephew. They're a wonderful, friendly people. As long as their bellies are full and their horror suites are working. But take away their creature comforts. Deprive them of food. Sleep, sonic showers. Put their lives in jeopardy over an extended period of time, and those same friendly, intelligent, wonderful people will become as nasty and as violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. You don't believe me? Look at those faces. Look in their eyes. This exploration of moral ambiguity and the ends justifying the means during times of war was something Sisko himself grappled with on numerous occasions. One most notable example of this was in the episode In the Pale Moonlight, in which he attempted to coerce the Romulans to enter the war. Sisko has to engage in some unethical behavior and make use of questionable channels to do so. He enlists the help of Garrick, who gets one of his contacts to forge holographic evidence that the Dominion will soon attack Romulus. The Romulan representative, Vrinak, thinks it's a fake. It's a fake! But before he can return to Romulus, Garrick destroys his ship. Sisko is furious, but realizes the optics of this terrible situation could be used to his advantage. The Tal Shiar will likely recover the damaged remains of the holographic recording, and any flaws in the data will probably just appear to be as a result of damage from the explosion. The destruction of the ship will look like an attempt to cover up the evidence, and so the Romulans will likely believe this false flag attack is real and will enter the war on the Federation's side. It's a very clever plan, and Sisko has to learn to live with this situation even though he knows everything about it was obviously immoral, the ends justified the means. I think the show's central thread throughout the seven seasons is the idea of finding one's place in the universe. By that I mean there's no one on the show who outwardly believes they're out-and-out -out evil. It's all just shades of grey. Even the Federation, supposed to be the good guys, with its Section 31 intelligence arm, is capable of some shady and morally dubious behavior. But whether it's Eddington fighting for the Maquis, Weyoun being motivated to do the bidding of the Founders, Quark's latest questionable scheme, or Garrick torturing Odo in the Dias cast, every character has a justification for their actions in their own minds, even if they make no sense to everyone else. Questions of absolute good and absolute evil are only really presented when we move beyond the corporeal characters and factions and begin dealing with the intangible actors like the prophets versus the parathes. 
Every character has some inner turmoil, regret or baggage they wish to address, overcome, atone for, and all of that serves as their motivation throughout the series. We basically get to know the characters as much as they get to know themselves. Examples of this would include the death of Sisko's wife and how that shapes him as a man and a single father of his son Jake. Bashir's revelation of his genetic engineering, Odo's divided loyalty between his people and the Federation, Kira's ongoing struggle to overcome her hatred of Cardassians and having to put aside what happened during the war and the occupation of her planet. These are just some of the examples of the very believable motivations of the characters. Like, why does Damar begin drinking so heavily? Because he comes to realize that the Cardassians are just being used as pawns by the founders. So he eventually switches sides to fight against them. His development and growth from Dukat's shadow is very believable. It's a sign of very good writing that characters respond in believable ways based on their past histories. They want things for particular reasons. They're not just doing things arbitrarily because it's useful to the plot that week. They remain consistent with their own personalities and philosophies because of who they are, where they came from, what's happened to them in their lives, and ultimately, where they want to be next. And oftentimes, what a character thinks they want is precisely what they don't need. Isn't that true of many things in our lives? There's so many memorable episodes of the show, like Trials and Tribulations that celebrated 30 years of Star Trek, The Visitor, Worf's introduction in The Way of the Warrior, Once More Into the Breach, Past Tense, The Jemadar, Duet, Far Beyond the Stars, Rapture, Defiant, and tons more. The show didn't sugarcoat any of the themes it explored. It pulled no punches. It presented war, politics, conflict, adversity, human nature, the challenges of life with warts and all. There's so many timeless messages in there that resonate today, not to mention some of the best space battles of any sci-fi series. This was just a general overview of the show. I will probably go into more detail of specific story arcs and episodes in the future. But for now, I will say this. If you haven't seen Star Trek Deep Space Nine, you're missing out on something truly special.